So just a bit of introduction to myself. My name is Margarita Reardon. I'm a final year medical student at Aston University in Birmingham. And I've been involved with Consilium Scientific before as a project lead for a study by Transvarimed, which was published back in June. Um, also relevant, I've been involved with Universities Allied for Essential Medicines, or UAEM, so I was on the UK National Committee about two years ago now, and I also do some work with the British Medical Association. So just a bit of background to myself, and obviously I'll be introducing the panellists in a couple of minutes. So just in terms of, you know, the whole topic of tonight and why transparency is important, well, there are obviously many reasons that I'm sure more a lot of you are aware of. So it impacts healthcare, research, and policy making. If trials aren't published in a timely manner, it leads to research waste, leading to gaps in the scientific record, along with duplication, and of course, even worse than that, lots of money being wasted that's publicly funded. Unregistered clinical trials leads to also the systemic distortion of medical evidence and of course we all know positive trial outcomes tend to be um, overproduced compared to negative ones and this publication bias also leads to an overstatement of both the efficacy of drugs and medical devices so that's why we're all here today and we all care about it in terms of the key elements, and this is kind of really relevant to the study I published myself looking at WHO and specifically their guidelines on trial registration, journal publication and registry reporting. And apologies for the background noise. <laughs> I live in a very, very busy um, city centre in Birmingham. Sorry about that. So regarding trial registration, um, before any clinical trials initiated, the details must be registered in a publicly available trial registry. And this would be hoped that it would be before the first subject is rec either recruited or the medical intervention is given, but or at least as soon as possible after this. With publication, WHO advises that it should be done in a time frame of 24 months. And then with registry reporting, it's advised that registry records are kept up to date, um, the results are posted within 12 months, and also that the protocol is posted to a registry within 12 months. And then just in general, why, is re why does registry reporting matter at all? So it's not just a case really of making sure that things get published in a journal. This also matters because it accelerates medical progress. As we all know um, too well, unfortunately, the process of getting things published takes a long, long time, whereas this allows faster reporting of results. It also ensures that results posted on registries give a more accurate and perhaps comprehensive picture than that would be in journals. And it also enables us to you know, identify potential safety risks, perhaps, um, regarding medicines before they get to market. And then just to flag some relevant data from countries and what's going on in the world. So Germany, it's been reported that 30% never report in any form. And it's even worse in the USA, it's actually at 39%. And a study of 30 UK universities revealed um, that 1.6% had reported according to WHO's best practice time frame of 12 months. And I think um, we have Sarai in the audience and she was involved in that study. So you can see with all the major countries involved in major research and with a lot of great institutions, things still look pretty dire. So now I'm going to hand it over to Gustav to give a little intro into the more data. Thank you very much, Margrit. Um, my name is Gustav Nilsson. I'm a medical doctor by training and an associate professor at Karolinska Institute in Stockholm. And now I'm going to very briefly show results from a project where we have followed up clinical trials reporting at Nordic medical universities and university hospitals. This slide intends to communicate that it's an important problem, but I won't repeat what Marguerite has already said. Uh, I'll simply note that when trials are not reported, then we get the wrong idea about what treatments are effective and what to believe in. So, 
We followed up Nordic trials that were registered either in the EU clinical trials registry or on clinicaltrials.gov and that were completed in 2016 to 2019, meaning that the last data point was collected and the authors marked the trial in the registry as having been completed. We included only trials where the sponsor is either a university with a medical faculty or a university hospital because as uh, uh, publicly funded institutions, uh, they have a, a particular uh, role in the ecosystem. And what we looked at was quite simply uh, how many of the studies report results uh, in any way. So that includes either uploading summary results to the repository or publishing a scientific uh, article. Uh, and identifying and matching these articles required very much manual work. Uh, we had a great team of collaborators that did uh, all of this uh, searching and matching. Uh, so we looked at how many studies reported any results and how long did it take from completing the study until the results were reported. The protocol was pre-registered. There were just over 2,000 uh, trials in the sample. About half were from Denmark, about one third were uh, trials of medicinal products and uh, the not medicinal product uh, category here contains a, a quite heterogeneous mix uh, of research. Some is more, uh, I would say, basic research. Uh, some is um, other kinds of clinical research. And here are the main results. This graph shows the time from completion of the trial until uh, results were published either in an article or on the repository and as you can see uh, after two years about half of the studies were published at the end of followed up a follow-up about one in five had still not reported results here are some comparisons where we see uh, at the top any results reported at the end of follow-up between the nordic countries in the middle, uh, any results published within two years, and at the bottom, whether summary results were uploaded to the registry, and that was just a few percentage points that were uploaded to re the registry within one year, uh, as they wanted to be uh, for pharmaceutical trials. We want to continue this work. Uh, we want to uh, put up uh, an online resource. Uh, where the sponsors can be compared, like the uh, German Into Value team has done. We want to carry on the follow-up and look at uh, longer times, more sponsors, and so on. We want to look more closely at the quality of the uh, published research. For example, whether the papers report the same outcomes as uh, were registered in the registries. And we're looking to join efforts with other teams. And of course, uh, to talk to various stakeholders, and that is the topic today. Lastly, I want to thank the whole team, and in particular, Katrin Axfors, a, a very uh, talented postdoc who uh, was um, absolutely uh, instrumental in driving this work. And a few of our collaborators are here, so thank you. Thank you so much, Gustav, for sharing that. And just before I introduce the panel just letting you guys know if anyone has any questions at all feel free to type it in the chat as we go on throughout the night and um if the i can let the panel know um as we go along so please be as interactive as possible and this should be a nice informal discussion for everyone to get involved so just to introduce our other panelists we have sarai and she has successfully campaigned for clinical trial transparency in the UK with UAEM, so Universities Allied for Essential Medicines, and she's now advocating for greater transparency in the Netherlands. And we also have Bettina, so she's a patient advocate who's reported, who's repeatedly published or pushed for clinical trial results to be made public. Um, and unfortunately, we had two of our panelists who weren't able to come tonight. Um, but just before um, I open it up, I have a general question for you guys. So based on your experience, how could the Nordic and Canadian data be used to advocate for better trial reporting and kind of taking into account what approaches have worked well in other countries that you think perhaps could be helpful with this?
Um, I'm happy to say something on this topic. Um, so for us, uh, what really helped us in the United Kingdom is that first of all, um, we created a report where we made people aware of the publishing gap or the reporting gap that there is at UK universities. And I would say that many people were just not aware of this fact in the first place. And then what was very important is to make politicians aware that this is a problem and that this is a problem that is um, uh, hurting uh, the progress of science and creating a lot of research waste. And what really helped us then is that the politicians took this very seriously and they sent a letter to all universities saying that they had half a year to clear up the um, outstanding trials that they had not reported on. And after that half year, they would have to come to the Houses of Parliament for a discussion to uh, look at who was able to report their trials now and who wasn't able to report their trials um, in time. And I think this political pressure really helped us in in the UK to ensure that universities uh, improve their clinical trial reporting. So when we first looked at reporting performance on the EU uh, database, only 29% of uh, UK universities had published their summary results 12 months after the trial had ended. And this reporting performance went up to 91% um, after the intervention of the politics, but also uh, our clinical trial campaign together with many of our allies. So what I really believe is that it's really important that you make politicians aware that this is a problem and it's an important problem and you have them as allies in your campaign. Well, that's really amazing to hear and about how as students you actually had, you know, just by a bit of determination, you were actually able to get the politicians to enact on it. I was just wondering, because sometimes issues like maybe not perhaps in the clinical trial transparency domain, but things are raised by students and they write to their MP, but nothing really happens. Why do you think it was so successful um, with your guys' attempt? Or is there anything we can learn from that or how to make your lobbying more effective? Well, it was definitely not us, just us. I mean, uh, we worked together with many other organizations and I think they were also instrumental in this, especially the evidence-based medicine lab in Oxford. And I think what was very important was that it was already on the politician's radar that clinical trial transparency is important. Um, there was a group within um, the House of Commons that focuses on science and technology specifically. And they had just written a report on clinical trial uh, transparency. But what we did is point out that universities are an important factor here and that they sometimes actually perform worse than industry on reporting their trials on time. Um, and I think what's really important to realize here, it's not malice or something that people are not uh, publishing their trials. Uh, I think we created a system where it's uh, people are incentivized to register their trial in the first place because otherwise they won't be able to publish the results uh, in the end because most medical journeys, uh, journals uh, require you to pre-register your clinical trial. However, in some strange way, clinical, um, I, I mean, medical journals don't require you to report the results on the clinical trial websites um, or the registers where you first registered them. And I think this is a major reason why people are incentivized to register, but not necessarily to report. Um, and because there's no uh, real consequences right now to not publishing your results, or at least there is no legal consequences that are enforced. Although there are some things written in the law, people don't enforce the sanctions that they can apply. As a result, it's very easy to just not publish your results on a clinical uh, trial registry, just because people aren't aware um, and it's easy not to do it. Maybe I can say something um, to to comment on that. So um, I'm running a European patient network in melanoma where we've had um, many, many trials because the original therapies that was chemotherapy was not particularly effective. And we had a number of new trials, like new drugs coming through. So we're as patient community are definitely a community that is familiar with, with clinical trials. And those were like in that type, those were um, industry sponsored trials. So academic trials are coming now, but it is as a community, we've kind of lived and breathed trials and we've been very dependent on them. And we've been kind of looking and 
reporting when talking about them. And this is actually, this is how we got to uh, to meet Transpariment. Um, and of course, for us, tribes that do not show up or from whom we don't learn are a disaster because the risk of a repetition is very, very high. And I think that uh, patient communities in that case, and we have done this now repeatedly. So whenever there comes a new kind of a new report out focusing a certain country, what we do is we tag the colleagues in these countries who are directly affected by these outcomes. And uh, because we're usually rather well connected and rather good on the communication side um that causes a lot of like awareness um and also embarrassment on the other side so i think the one what what the data the numbers have been really really helpful so to have it also comparison between countries always work fantastic so if one country does really well and a similar country does very poorly um that usually creates some action at, at country level so just being able to track and monitor what's going on i think that was the first thing that made a real difference because otherwise you talk about theory the moment you have the numbers that was the first time things started moving then um i am i am one i was one of the 15 experts on the first eu cancer mission board so i've done a lot of um, research policy at a uh, european level and if you go into what the motivation for uh, the european commission at the moment are when it comes to um, patient and citizen engagement there's a really really um there's a big worry that uh, we are moving towards um a society that does not believe in science so anything in the in the order of accountability and transparency towards society uh, is taken really really seriously and that's not just the european commission that's also national funders because if our populations don't believe in science there will be no science funding and i think we have all seen under covid how risky that is so this type of not reporting and not being accountable towards society is not People used to get away with it, but it's become increasingly unacceptable because there's a general understanding how dangerous that, how dangerous that becomes for our societies. And I think this is this is the angle to take that. And then last but not least, uh, what we have seen that I was involved in some discussions uh, that was in Germany that um, very much, as you already said, um, university, I mean, it's time report, the reporting is painful. They're now trying to support and make it easier, but it requires resources. If there is no consequences for not reporting, you will put the resources somewhere else. The moment a university is shamed in public, they suddenly find the resources and then suddenly the results go into the, into the, into the registry where they should have been in the first place. So it is also a resource issue. It's not necessarily some might really not have the resources, which means that if we finance trials, there has to be a resource for, for reporting and it should be allocated. In my opinion, it should be a ring fence so it shouldn't be something that you could otherwise use for something else because you will always find something else to do so there should be a ring fence reporting requirement and the resources for it asking for people asking or blaming people for something for which they have no kind of capacity i don't think is the way to go but i think that is kind of that serious from visualization people understanding the severity and context and realizing that this is also like a management issue that we have to tackle i think has made a difference Yeah, I think that's really important to note as to why it's written in bold that you have to register, but then there's no incentive really at the end point. And of course, limited resources, time, they're not going to do it unless they're actual sanctions. So I think that's really interesting to note and quite strange when you think about it, why it doesn't exist to begin. So I think that's definitely something we need to push for. I, I don't think it does change. I don't think, just think about it. You want to publish first. I mean, just like Gustav just said, he can't share his data because it's not published yet. I mean, this is this is publish or perish. This is how academia works. Of course, no one is going to upload anything in a public registry before not having it published. And the moment you have it published, you're already on to the next problem. So, you know, kind of for you, the thing is closed. Who mm. then wants to go on and publish? Oh, you know, fill registries. So I'm not even surprised. I'll let Sarai pop in. Yeah, I just wanted to make one quick note that uh, the International Council of Journal, uh, I mean, medicine, medical journal editors, that's the ICMGA, they are the people that collectively decided they will only publish studies um, that are pre-registered. However, there's a lot of ways that studies can fall through the cracks. There are some really uh, interesting studies where they try to just get their study published that was never registered and see 
uh, how many journals they have to write to before someone bites, so to speak. Um, but what is really important is that the same council has also said that they will not consider publishing on a clinical trial re a register as previous publication, and that should not affect whatsoever the publication of your data in a peer-reviewed academic journal. So I think this is something that many researchers don't know. Um, and I experienced this actually in my own work, like when I'm not doing this, I'm, I'm a PhD student, and I suggested to my supervisors that we have to publish publish our results within 12 months of the study ending. Uh, but then I got similar replies where they said, okay, first write your academic article. And once that's in press, then you're allowed to update the clinical trial registry. And I explained to them that like the, the medical journal won't mind like officially if you already uh, put the data on the register, but they wanted to do it their way. So it's more also about challenging people in these kind of beliefs and making them aware that there is an option of actually publishing your data on a clinical trial registry and that that will not uh, bar you from publishing it later in an academic journal. Um, as everyone is aware that academic publication can take a long time. Yeah, it's, inter it's kind of ironic that you kind of encountered those kind of pushbacks from your own colleagues when you're so involved in all of this as well. And just, you can imagine how prominent it is. And it's these things happening at a local level. It, it, it's, it's the reason for why we have these dismal results and we report on it. Uh, Bettina? But I think when to an underestimate, being scooped is a big thing. So, you know, it's just like with the clinical trials, maybe not so easy, but you often clinical trials are not particularly innovative, let's face it. So the designs are very similar and you might have like, you know, an analysis that is really what someone else is. And then you lose that and you lose the novelty and that damages your career. So as long as we punish people for being honest and for reporting, nothing will happen. And it might not happen, but then it might. And it could also be like, you know, a, a reviewer who hasn't checked the brief that you can publish on a registry. So as long as we really have to protect, you have to protect the people who are doing who are doing the reporting. I mean, you can also do it at the same time. I, for example, wouldn't have a problem, but it's very valid that academic publication that can go on forever until you have something in a journal. So. Um, you know, um, I just think like, I do believe that making things like public and transparent and visible has really helped, but singling out individuals um, is not the way to go to improve things. For sure, definitely. I'll let um, Gustav pop in. I have so many thoughts on all of this, but uh, I'll try not to speak for the remainder of our time. Um, but first, I want to say that we try in this case to um, practice what we preach and uh, we're going to release the data as soon as we uh, have run the last checks uh, which uh, I think will be in the next uh, two or three weeks hopefully then we'll immediately post a preprint and all the data will be posted online uh, and of course we're very happy if anyone else wants to um, uh, look around or maybe find something new or uh, do anything interesting whatsoever. Now on the general situation from a researcher's point of view, of course, the, the publication in a journal is not something we can control. And uh, I'm a bit um, amazed, uh, I have to say, even after all this time, at the, uh, the inconsistency between the WHO statement, which says that we should publish in a journal within 24 months, uh, and, and the researcher's ability to actually uh, make that happen <laughs> or not. Uh, it, I'm sure all of us who are in research have had papers that have been rejected time and time again and or that have gone through very lengthy review processes in several rounds where the reviewers request new data and new analyses. Um, so again, from the researcher's point of view, incentives are, are really perhaps the operative word. But then also, as was already pointed out, perhaps we shouldn't leave this in the lap of the individual researcher. Uh, as is often the case now. And when I talk to my colleagues about this, uh, they often raise things like, but what if the PhD student who's working on this uh, goes on maternity leave uh, or paternity leave? Uh, we can't pull their paper out from their resume and we can't make them work <laughs> while they're on leave and so on. 
but why haven't we organized uh, our enterprise uh, so that uh, th there is a redundancy? Why does it have to depend on a single person? Uh, I think that's um, a very old type of organization uh, that doesn't really uh, uh, match the needs uh, of, of research today. But what are we going to do now? If I can ask you, who have a lot of experience, I, I've been talking to various stakeholders in Sweden already. But um, what what have been some success stories that you've seen? Some key messages that, you, or ways to get a message across, for example. If I don't know if Bettina has her hand up for a different reason. <laughs> but I mean, I, I can comment on that. So I think I've, I totally agree with you that putting it on the poor PhD student is not the way to go. And often the universities who clear the backlog then have someone in the administration responsible for the reporting. Uh, a comment that we found was also that people find the reporting very hard if they do it once in a lifetime. If you've never done this before, it's a huge thing. If this is your job and you do it regularly, you would do this in a fraction of a time. And they say also that if you have a person who is responsible, let's say, to report all the trials of an institution you start they start standardizing the data collection because often what is asked is not what people have and then you have to go fishing and until you have it so the if you have a process in place so i think advocating for a process that universities put a process in place have a person who's responsible and not does it once in a lifetime but have us have a consistent like a, a, a standard operating procedure i think that would be a good step, uh, way to go um usually so something for sweden because uh, gustav I, I live in Uppsala, so i'm just around the corner um, I do think that talking to research funders is a good idea. So go directly to put it onto their agenda. You fund research, so maybe you should uh, make sure that this happens. Um, funding is something that researchers tend to, so I, I also have a PhD. I worked as a postdoc a few years. I understand exactly where the incentives in there are. Um, money people get. Um, so I think that would be something. Um, raising awareness, I think, is definitely something um, that, that has to come and that one should publish. So going in and getting into the different scientific channels, I think uh, we can talk afterwards if you like, uh, I think really, really helps and make it kind of ubiquitous. And I think getting this tone right is really important to on one side say, OK, this is unacceptable, but not stitch up or target single individuals. I think getting that and especially if you live in the Nordics, I think that's something to pay attention to. Just saying. Thank you so much for that, Bettina and Soraya. Yeah, I just wanted to say that I think uh, it is a management issue indeed in some sense. And we saw that the UK universities that improve the most are the ones that uh, create an organized unit uh, where there is someone or like some people that are in charge of like registering all the clinical trials that are happening at the university and reporting their outcomes and following up on the um, uh, PIs that have not reported. And that we saw also the biggest improvement uh, in such universities that ha have better policies and that have such uh, management units. Um, so I think it is really something that you want to pressure the university into taking up as, as an important issue. And this is something that I've struggled with myself now in the Netherlands, at least at my own university, um, where I've been struggling to find who feels responsible enough uh, for these clinical trials to um, do something about it. Uh, for example, I talked to the Medical Ethics Committee um, at my local university, and they were only so-so about that it's their responsibility, although, as you just mentioned, mentioned uh, clinical trial transparency is also enshrined in the uh, Helsinki Declaration on um, doing medical research in humans. And similarly, we have talked to the national regulator here in the Netherlands, who is in charge of regulating the ethics of all medical research in humans. And they also were not really aware that it is an ethical requirement. And although they manage our Dutch clinical trial registry, which is linked to the WHO clinical trial registry, um, um, they also 
haven't really thought about transparency as much as an issue. Um, so it's also really trying to find who's responsible for enforcing these rules, uh, how to make people aware that these rules are being violated. Um, and I think for that, it's also really important to go uh, to the press and create more public opinion on this. And for that, it's especially important to also uh, have the voices heard of people that participated in clinical trials. Um, so people, for example, through Bettina's network, uh, I'm sure there would be um, patient advocates advocates that could speak up or also through other patient networks because um, one way or the other what what is the most shocking thing about this is that humans gave their time their health um, all this effort to participate in a clinical trial that then just ended up being research waste and that is a tragedy and it's those patient advocates that you should have speak out and it's those stories that will help people convince to make a difference in Nordic countries that's my belief yeah I think patients are definitely owed that especially if you know they're putting their potentially themselves at risk and if it's obviously not reported that's really insulting in a way. It's definitely not ethical. And it's in, a, as you said, a declaration of Helsinki. Um, I'll put it on to Bettina. She's got her hand up. So I, I think just something that we all have to be aware of, that clinical trials fall into this gray space between research and healthcare delivery. And all our countries, um, and Sweden is a bad example for that, have separated actually their research activities from their healthcare activities. And if you look at how the systems are organized, how they're financed, what the cultures in the systems are, even how people are, you know, hired, they're very, they're very, very different. And often the, the cracks happen at the interface. So, and that goes across, that's not just clinical trials. So if you had, for example, if you go into a hospital and you have a tumor and the tumor gets taken out and gets analyzed in one lab, there's a diagnostic lab that will give you a diagnosis and that's a validated process and that's very controlled. And then there is maybe a research lab that can be in the same house that does an analysis and you would not believe the data sets often don't talk to each other. So you have like your same tumor in two places and data sets and information that does not get integrated. So most people are not aware of this separation. And what happened in Germany when we had the problem with the trial reporting is that the health ministry didn't feel responsible for it because clinical trials are research. And the research ministry didn't feel responsible because this is definitely healthcare because there are people on there, right? So it was quite embarrassing. It was very public. So, it would, you know, I put some snarky remarks on that as well. But, you know, just like after some while, they figured out that this was pathetic. I mean, this was not acceptable. We have to be aware. So we had this, this, this interface where no one, there is no clear party. There are lots of regulation, but the, the responsibilities are tied between different places. So I'm not surprised that no one really knows who, whose job it should be. Which means that one has to make it public and then say, as you said, this is unacceptable. So please, let's find a solution. So I think that is the way to go. But I thought it was quite, uh, that was quite impressive. Like, it's not us. It's not us. Like, okay, so who is it? Um, also, that shouldn't be the case, by the way. I think this is this is part of a bigger problem. We have to think about this, what I call experimental medicine. There is medicine that is not evidence-based because it is under development. Uh, the case numbers are too small. Um, if you're in cancer, a lot of cancer research or cancer treatment is in this space, which is not. Because everything is unique, people are out of options, and that space is really difficult. And we fall directly into that. So maybe one should make it also part of a bigger discussion. So not just the reporting, but, you know, why is this an issue and why is this such a sensitive space and why is this space so important uh, to get more attention to it? Yeah, I think that's a really important point. If you don't have any one individual actually responsible, then nothing's really going to happen. You have it just like, you know, enforcing sanctions. You have to have somebody who's got responsibility therefore to get that action um but it's again a bit of a mystery why it's never really been put written put in stone who actually is responsible is it the research department or the health department um sarai 
Yeah, just to add one thing here, uh, I think it's also important to realize that uh, all the Nordic countries, or like not all of them, actually, some of them are part of the EU. Um, and within the EU clinical trial regulation uh, that came into force the 31st of January 2022, um, it actually says that making the results of drug trials public on the European registry will become um, a national legal requirement for the sponsor in all 27 member states. So one way or another, all these countries must have it enshrined in some way, enshrined in their laws, some kind of sanctions now as well um, against non-reporting. That doesn't mean that they're enforced or that it's easy to find in the law. I don't have a legal background. I really struggled to understand where it was in Dutch law. Um, and I'm only now kind of finding out who's responsible for enforcing this uh, and who can actually do the sanctions. Um, but it should be there in every uh, law of a European country. Uh, so I would also advise to find out where it is in the law and who's responsible for enforcing it. And then just ask them like, hey, this is our data. When are you going to do something about this? Just one comment on that. Um, that covers the drug trials. That doesn't cover academic trials, to my knowledge. So in the UK, so far, the registration and all the obligations are so if you have a developing a new product that you want like to submit for market authorization. But the worst offenders and the non-reporting are the academics. Because if you look at the data, it's often the companies who did better, but also it's a resource issue. So they put a person behind it and it happens while the academic institutions were the ones who dragged their feet. So that, in my opinion, will not help us. I, of course, would like to see the academic trials also registered in the same resource. Why should we just register the one and not the other? Now we have this trial registry in Europe, which just has part of the truth. So we still go to clinicaltrial.gov to find our trials. So we have our academic trials in Europe are registered in the US, but not in Europe. That's crazy. So, you know, I think there's a lot of work that uh, remains to be done. Yeah, just to echo this, like, well, there is a lot of academic drug trials that also register, register on the EU CTR, like more, more than enough still that we should follow up on. Um, that it is indeed true, and we saw that as well uh, in the UK, that a lot of uh, universities resort to registering on US um, uh, clinical registers, so clinicaltrials.gov, in case it's not a CTIMP trial, so that's a clinical trial of investigative medical products. Um, and there is no real regulation of UK universities registering on the US um, database, and it's also not clear who is responsible for enforcing rules there. Um, and because of that, what we saw is that although in the UK, uh, universities really, really imported their reporting on the EU clinical trial registry, because that, that's what people paid attention to. That's the thing that's now also enshrined in law. People totally forgot about the US registry. Um, and we have not really seen improvements on reporting there, despite improvements seen on the European registry. Um, so I think that's also really important to note that uh, there is no dedicated space, um, easy dedicated space within Europe to register a clinical trial that is not a, a CTIM trial. So for example, medical devices um, or, or other kinds of uh, health interventions. Very interesting to note as well, just um, in terms of time as well, if anyone in the audience has any questions, I know you've been very quiet so far, but even if you just want to put up your hand, unmute yourself and um, to get, you know, if you have any questions from our panelists or anything so far that um, you've different views on or anything you want clarifying, do um, unmute yourselves. Um, I don't know if, if Gustav had any thoughts on what's been, what Sarai and Bettina have spoken about. He's been a bit quiet. <laughs> it's um, very inspirational, and um, I agree with most of the things that have been said. Uh, we are definitely going to try to uh, get uh, the politicians interested in this. Uh, also, patient organizations, which are a group of stakeholders that I haven't been uh, in touch with yet. So I'd really like to have uh, some more uh, conversation with you, Bettina, if you uh, would be uh, open for that. Absolutely. That's great. 
well, I might add that this is, um, of course, um, very much a global problem. And the data that we found in this project look a lot like data that have been observed in other places, notably in Germany. Uh, the methodology which you used is very similar to that used by the InterValue project in Germany, and the results are highly similar. And I expect more or less every country will have to deal with this issue. Uh, and even other kinds of research, like animal research, will have to figure out uh, how to deal with non-reporting uh, and uh, catching up with uh, pre-registration uh, as a norm in the scientific community and so on. Very true. I think um, I can see that Michael wants to talk. I uh, I re regret that I missed the f first uh, minutes because uh, I was in a meeting. But here here in Canada, where I'm sitting in, in Ottawa, uh, there is a great deal of uh, kind of secrecy around all kind of medical device trials. They details are locked up in research ethics boards, which are sort of controlled mainly in universities. And uh, one may not know anything really uh, because they're said to be commercial activities. And so uh, the company will lose their competitive advantage. And, uh, you know, the failed ones tend to get canceled. Uh, the the uh, safety case, I guess, uh, which is something I'm familiar with as an engineer, uh, is can't be known. So the whether the trial is safe enough, uh, what mitigations, what hazards, how are they mitigated, all of this is uh, secret. And the legislation is written so that it is not discoverable at all, including by the participants in the trial. And uh, some of them go on for 20 years. They are studies involving families and children are roped into them. And at the end, they say, oh, yeah, we found nothing useful. And in the meantime, 20 years of medications have been given to uh, children. So I'll stop there because I'm not educating innocent people, but it's quite unusual and at variance with what I'm used to as a, an engineer, like uh, I used to do driverless man mass transit. I could not put a washer on the train uh, without justification for why it's there in the first place, what its function is, can it be removed? Book this thick, the safety case, where is it uh, in this field? So I'm confused and can tell you a little bit about what goes on in Canada, but uh, I'll stop talking then. But thank you for the work you're doing. And if I can contribute, I'd like to. So. Thank you so much, Michael, and especially from your perspective as an engineer, it's quite interesting to see how you view it. And also by the looks of it, you know, the safety measures aren't as stringent as, you know, your own speciality. So it's definitely something that needs to be worked on. I think David's got it. Oh, can just, I yeah. just respond to, to say that we are, in fact, building a database of volunteers to help out with future research. Uh, so uh, do please uh, get in touch if you like, Michael. I'll put my email in the chat. I will. I'm I'm good with numbers or, or used to be. So. <laughs> I, I, I know how to get things out of databases and visualize them. So Amazing. happy to help to the extent I can. So I'm here and I'll get in touch for sure. And David's had his hand up. Yes, I, I was a bit uh, interested in the suggestion that preclinical research should do this. I mean, the largest part of preclinical research except in psychology, which is always an exception, <laughs> it is not really testing a particular hypothesis. My, my work on single ion channels certainly wasn't. And I don't really see how it could be done. Neither, neither is it critically important to patients whether they know what the result of my work, work trying to do maximum likelihood fits with ion channel mechanisms. So I, I think a lot of pre, not non-clinical research, not pre-clinical, non-clinical, is perhaps not appropriate to do this. But I'd be interested to hear if there's other opinions.
Maybe who should go can... first? <laughs> like, I don't know. I don't know who put their hand up first. I suppose Gustav as he's unmuted and Sarai then Bettina. All right. Well, uh, thank you, David, for that question. Uh, I have indeed studied your work on ion channels. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and my own background is as a, a wet lab scientist. Uh, it's a very different kind of science compared to the clinical trials, much more exploratory. Uh, I used to uh, be in a position where I could come up with an idea in the morning and then go into the lab in the afternoon and start taking out uh, antibodies and reagents and begin to test it. And often it, I didn't even get out of the um, starting blocks, as it were, couldn't get the right experimental conditions. None of that was ever reported. Should it be? Well, perhaps it could save somebody else a false uh, start, or maybe not. But certainly, I would argue that there are uh, kinds of animal experiments uh, <clears throat> that have similarities to clinical trials that are designed on beforehand uh, to run on a certain cohort of animals uh, with predetermined outcomes. And they should be, uh, in my opinion, pre-registered uh, and reported. And I do believe, although I haven't got any data to back it up, that many uh, animals are dying in vain at present because results are not being reported. Uh, however, I'm not making the strong claim that every result should always be reported in these cases. But still, I think uh, there is improvement to be made. Yes, I some, some sorts, yes. That, that, that raises the difficult question of who decides which sort. But... <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, David, I just want to I, I've put it in the chat now, uh, a paper uh, by a friend of mine who's uh, made a website called uh, for clinical trial registration for preclinical research. And it's indeed mainly for animal studies. They're encouraging people uh, to pre-register what kind of research they want to do uh, in the animals uh, and then also a report on that. Um, and I think a very important point there is like the unnecessary dying of the of the animals for sure, but also um, that it prevents people from um, changing their primary and secondary, like the outcome switching or p-hacking, all this kind of things that we want to avoid also with the registration and reporting of clinical trials and um, that that's also really important for animal studies at the very least and then for the much earlier than that even studies I think Gustav has already spoken on that and knows much more on that yes well p-values that's another question altogether in which I've been interested yeah I mean <laughs> I'm, I'm not a fan of the p-value let's let's just also put that out there um but I just mean that that I think animals also deserve that we pre-register and report uh, the uh, research we do on them I think it's important to report negative results and we have done that of course lots of journals don't like it but that's that's a problem one of a zillion problems with the publication system that we're lumbered with at the moment, and it needs to be changed, I think. Um, but the, good, the best journals will, the Journal of General Physiology, which is the sort of top journal for uh, quantitative mechanistic sort of work of the sort that I like, um, they, they'll publish negative results, and, and all journals should do, of course. Yeah, I think all journals should and not enough journals to do. Uh, we once suggested as a joke, there should be a journal for non-working clinical trials or non-working global health interventions. Uh, but we thought that if you call a journal like that, people probably don't want to publish in it because it doesn't look very good on your academic track record. Um, which highlights the problem, uh, which is why a lot of people don't publish negative results or try to make them look more positive than they actually are. I'm handing over to Bettina because her hand was also up. Um, just uh, as an example, where what type of early research one could think about tracking more successfully? I'm not like, I'm not for adding reporting burden on top of everything. But if you think, for example, about biobanks and how we use the samples in there, especially if they're valuable. Um, sample collections that I think there we would benefit from more transparency. Uh, there are often biobanks that I call them bioarchives. Uh, stuff goes in but never out, um, and that is a missed opportunity for for patients and society. So I think that is something where one could think of, and that is relatively early research. But there, the sample um, is the valuable the valuable thing. 
And I think the one thing about if you've ever worked in a lab is the problem with negative results is that you often don't know whether it's really not working or you just made a mistake. So validating that something is really not working takes a lot of effort. And the writing up of a negative result takes you as much, if not more time, than writing up a positive result. And none of us uh, is ever doing just one experiment. So if you do three in parallel and one works, you're going to focus on the one that works. So I think this is also a little bit, you know, how science actually <laughs> works. And there's so many, especially if you're in a, working in a biological system, um, there are so many reasons why things fail um, that you can't control. So, you know, I think this is why one has to be in theory, yes, um, but one also has to be a bit realistic, um, especially if you combine it then with the incentives that we put on researchers. And if you've ever been a researcher and you're aware of the contracts that people are having, um, actually, I'm always surprised that there isn't even more fraud because the pressure on people is extremely high. So, um, you know, when we can wish for things, but if we don't know or if we don't have a strategy to implement it realistically, we can just, we're just going to keep talking. Yes, well, I'm, I I would say there's no such thing as a negative, negative or a positive result. There are right and wrong results. <laughs> very, very good point to end on. Um, we're uh, drawing up towards the close. I was wondering, have people any final remarks or anything else that you guys wanted to bring up? during the discussion that we haven't touched upon um, just in the last five minutes of the of the talk. Uh, Sarai, go ahead. Well, I, I, I wanted to bring in a positive message because I think a lot of it can seem quite disheartening. Uh, but what I always try to think is that in the past, it used to be the case that we didn't really focus on open access publishing, right? This was not necessarily something uh, that happened a lot and most of the things were behind a paywall. Unfortunately, this is still the case uh, with quite a lot of journals. But what we see is that there is a really a major change happening. And I think what you see is that uh, both funders, universities, uh, but also journals uh, are creating all these mechanisms through which you can do uh, open access publishing. Um, and I think the narrative on this has also really shifted. So what I'm really hoping is that in a similar way, we can shift the narrative on seems a bother and it, like why should you do it in the first place a lot of people are not aware that it is important and I hope we can change the general narrative to um, have institutions and um, uh, funders really support uh, clinical trial transparency in that way um, so yeah that's it for me thank you so much Sarai has Gustav or Bettina any final words of wisdom to impart in the audience before we go. Maybe big thanks to Gustav. Um, this type of stuff is a lot of work, so I'm glad you did it uh, for Sweden. So it's really, really helpful. As I said, having the data and having being able to share it and talk about it is, is usually what kicked off change in other countries. So thanks for that. <laughs> Well, uh, thank you very much. And uh, again, this is very much a, a team effort. Perhaps I too can end on a, a positive note. Actually, the results that we have seen are a bit better than I would have uh, bet on. And uh, uh, there is great scope for improvements, which is also uh, a really positive message that I like to uh, put out there. I'm not sure if Gustav has frozen on me or he stopped talking. Has he? <laughs> yes, that was all I wanted now. to say. <laughs> His eyebrows are moving. Very, very still. <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody. Uh, especially... David, yeah. uh, has David his hand up or is he clapping? I can't see the difference. I think he's not up. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> clapping. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody, and especially thank you to our panelists, Gustav, Sarai, and Bettina. And please have a look at what's been popped in the chat at the end um, if you want to subscribe to the channel and also, of course, to support Consilium Scientific. Um, so I'll let you off to the rest of your evenings and see you again.